Welcome back and good afternoon. Hope you enjoyed the weather and the various places uh, to choose from for lunch at the downtown. Um, we'll get started really about now. <laughs> Well, uh, my name is Bertrand Rigaldis. I'm an open source connections search consultant, and I'm excited to introduce our next speakers. So we'll start with Andy. Andy Tullis um, is a search, um, I'm sorry, a data scientist at uh, Shopify in the relevance team. His day-to-day -day work involves designing, implementing, and evaluating changes in search and making it better, I'm sure. Last year, he helped build search on the shop app for Shopify. And um, he's part of a very exciting joint data science and engineering team I, I heard about yesterday at the Mises conference. Thank you, Andy, for joining us. Uh, Doug Turnbull, I, I don't know how to introduce Doug. Uh, I mean, who doesn't know Doug in the assembly? Um, we know we've all read his book, uh, read his blogs, listened to his seemingly infinite number of YouTube videos. <laughs> and uh, he's, um, let's see, Doug, what's your, you're a senior staff engineer at Shopify, something like that. I'm sure you're doing great things there. <laughs> and as an ex-colleague, I miss you dearly. <laughs> With that said, take it on. Thank you, guys. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk today about, thanks everyone for coming, we're going to talk today during your, your lunch coma, just so you can digest and digest knowledge about uh, Bayesian optimization. So this is a technique, it's one of those techniques, you know, this is, this is not the, uh, I don't feel like this is the, the exciting bleeding edge, but this is the practical real life relevance work that, that we do. And I think this is one of those things that really should be in every relevance person's toolbox. So really what we're going to do is give a uh, educational overview, and then Andy's going to talk more concretely about how we have done it with some examples at Shopify. So uh, about discovery experiences at Shopify. So a lot of what this conference is, like I, I talked about uh, like plungers and things many years ago. Uh, a lot of what Shopify is, we're sort of helping so many of the small businesses uh, be able to sell online to, to multiple channels. Um, obviously, online store being prominent, and what's, of course, the how do you get connect to buyers on an online store if you're a merchant? I think search and discovery is front and center in that. So instead of uh, one big data problem, we have millions of little data problems that are extremely diverse and interesting and, and, and weird. And of course, our merchants are making up markets, so we get to, we get to deal with search in that context. Um, and of course, if, uh, if like every company, we're hiring. Uh, so shout outs and citations. I put this up front. I learned a lot from, from a lot of these different, these two blog articles, um, Josh, Josh Devins at uh, Elastic, does this with MS Marco. It's uh, the top MS Marco. At one point, it was the top non-neural MS Marco uh, performing thing, uh, solution. And then there's this great article on Bayesian optimization I really recommend that gets into the, into the weeds of this. Um, and if you want to see some other stuff, live coding and a concrete example that's using more open data sets, I've, I've put that, those links here. Um, this is uh, using in the Open Source Connections Hello LTR repo, which is a great repository for playing around with different techniques on some open open data sets. Um, and so, I want to talk a lot about. So, really, what this is about it's about optimizing a relevance approach or relevance strategy. It, you have these set of queer, you might say features, so to speak, or ranking signals. Um, and really, you, you already have sort of established that these are probably the things that you want to learn over. Um, and there are different approaches you could take to that. Now, the first stop that you know, people might naturally think is, I'm going to go do learning to rank, uh, which you know, is perfectly fine. Um, but before you get to that point of adding so much infrastructure and retraining infrastructure, uh, we like to think of this as maybe a halfway point to doing learning to rank. So it's sort of like optimizing an existing query strategy uh, with Elasticsearch, or not just Elasticsearch, any search engine, uh, without needing to build infrastructure. So what are the right boosts and weights for things like that? That's kind of the motivation for this. 
And to teach you about Bayesian optimization, that's my son Ian up there, um, I want to talk to you about baking. So baking is a process that, of course, takes time. We have to combine the ingredients. We have to bake it so many minutes. We have to taste and test it. And we have to upgrade the ingredient quantities. Uh, and then maybe try again. Now, of course, baking, we have, we can, just like we might like think roughly what features we want to rank search results with uh, after some work, we have our sort of initial ingredients that we are trying to bake a delicious cake from, we, but we don't quite know the right quantities. And uh, this is, these are actually cupcakes I baked for uh, my wife on her birthday during the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, literally screwed up the out of the box mix. Um, I used a, had a, about a whole stick of butter, so even though they looked terrible, they were delicious actually. Uh, so, what's that? Artistic. They're artistic, yeah, exactly, abstract art. So, uh, this is, but, but generally this is what we're trying not to do, right? And uh, of course, one option, uh, you may have heard the term grid search. You know, uh, sometimes machine learning is just like one for, another for loop inside of another for loop inside of another for loop until you find the, the maximum or the right, right optimum. And of course, we could try this. We could start with some ingredients and then we could come back around do a whole baking process, give it to my son, he could rate it, uh, and we could upgrade the ingredient qualities and increment one flour, one ounce, and continue to repeat and that kind of thing. Uh, of course, the problem is that baking is very time consuming, right? We have to wait 20 minutes at least, we have to wait for it to cool. So doing a grid search is quite expensive. And I sort of guess like, you know, roughly 60 years of baking to find an optimum. Not, not something we want, we want to be able to do. So uh, search relevance optimization is a lot like baking. We have, instead of ingredients, we have maybe, an, we could just think like boosts, but also things like BM25 parameters. Maybe a minimum should match, fuzziness values. All of these things that we want to vary during our optimization run. Uh, we might need to search some representative set of queries, which is, that is itself a whole separate talk. Uh, we, we need to evaluate relevance uh, using, you know, a good set of judgments, which uh, everyone went to, should have gone to Renee's talk, I hope, and saw that, because that's a good way of doing that. Uh, and then we have to upgrade our, our quantities and repeat. So if we did a grid search on this, it would take, if we, you know, one run is a minute, about four years. So grid search is usually not, not preferred, uh, although we, we, it is very easy to implement and we do it sometimes. So uh, one intuition comes up is if we observe what are sort of good and bad combinations. So if we know that roughly the stuff on the left maybe had an NDCG of 0.75, then we might assume that things close by also have an NDCG approximately 0.75 uh, with variance that increases in distance from this observation. Uh, so that's, that's a very key insight to Bayesian optimization, is that when you make an observation, things that are close by probably are similar. So if you go to a, if you go to a, uh, I don't know, uh, if you visit a beach at a certain time of year, it's likely that the temperature a few days after that is, is going to be relatively similar, maybe plus or minus 10, 20 degrees. And uh, of course, we might try nearby observations where uh, we're sort of guaranteed to be roughly in, in sync. Maybe uh, we might bake an okay cake, for example, and we might get an okay-ish cake after that. Might make it a little better, a little worse. And that's sort of like exploiting our existing knowledge. But often we, that's a trade-off, right? This is a classic trade-off in uh, sort of machine learning and, and, and data science. We may also want to really just explore the space. So we probe far out from our existing observation to explore, oh, what happens if I get even farther out and I want to take more risk? Maybe I could get the variance increases, which means the chance of me doing really well is a bit higher, but also the chance that I do really poorly is a bit higher. So you take a risk, you visit the beach maybe Maybe it turns out that August you visit the beach and it's beautiful, but it's crowded. So you try early October. It's a bit riskier because of the temperature, but the crowds might not be there if those are your success criteria. 
And this is actually how Gaussian regression works. So Gaussian regression is the model that's at the core of Bayesian optimization. What Gaussian regression does is it models, it, it basically, you could say it connects the dots, so to speak, of between these uh, observations that we've already made. Uh, here we have like actual cakes that are baked, and let's say we're rating cake deliciousness on a one to three scale. Uh, amount of flour that is, oh, okay, those are ounces. I was afraid that I was reading uh, months. Uh, amount of flour in ounces. And you can see, as we move away from existing observation, the gray region increases and widens. And as we get closer to those observations, it gets smaller. So we can kind of use this as a tool to map out how we probe uh, and balance our sort of desire for more knowledge to sort of exploit or ex explore the, sp the feature space or to maybe stay close to something that's already really good and maybe we just like fine tune it and make it a little bit better. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, is there enough possible upside or, or stay close to an existing observation? <clears throat> so of course search, we have this and we might ask ourselves what's the next title boost we should try? And uh, we sort of have this average DCG of two with a title boost of four something. And if we get a little bit of away, maybe we could be a little higher. It looks like if we tried on closer to 12 or zero, the variance is very high. So we take a bigger risk in wasting time, but there's a chance that we could do really well. So you're constantly balancing, like, how much information do I have versus how much should I exploit the existing knowledge that I have? <clears throat> So practically speaking, uh, how we do this, uh, one way we've done this at Shopify is we make a lot of use of Elasticsearch's uh, search templates, which are mustache templates, and that lets us plug in things like boosts and whatnot. Um, another thing that, and Andy will talk about at this too, is we also will optimize index time parameters, which of course is a bit tricky requiring you to create new indices. Um, <clears throat> the tricky thing is how do you choose the next candidate? So, of course, we could just, you know, I've talked theoretically about how we might do that and what the considerations are, uh, but we actually need like a, a way, an algorithm for doing this so that when we update what we want to try next, we can have like a, a sort of probabilistic founded way in doing this that sort of balances our explore versus exploit trade-off. Um, and, you know, to get started, you, this is just showing you what the code would look like if you trained one of these with, with, this, uh, with this model set up with a Gaussian process regressor. Here we have like our boosts, and we're trying to predict DCG, of course, and the Gaussian process regressor lets us, lets us uh, uh, train this, just for reference. <coughs> the scoring system that I'm going to talk about is sort of the first baby step, just to give you an intuition. There's actually an even better scoring system that we actually use called inspect expected improvement. But a, a sort of to give you an intuition, one system is like, let's say we took 10 random values for each of these boosts. Uh, <coughs> title, body fuzziness, and body boost. Uh, and we, we just sort of like did a ten, got 10 random values and we wanna see which one is the best candidate we should choose for our next round of, uh, of observation. So what we do is we say, okay, we had this existing observation that's our current best all the way at the top. We have title boost 10, body fuzziness three, and body boost two. And you can see that there's this one that's like the title boost 10 and so on that's fairly close. The, the Gaussian process regression standard deviation is low and it predicts a, a, a relatively high standard deviation and what predict probability of improvement is, is it's the expected uh, DCG minus the max. So you get basically the difference in DCG that, that is predicted divided by the standard deviation. So the more uncertainty there is, actually the, uh, the less likely you are you to pursue that. So it gets you at the probability that you are going to improve. Um, and this is you know just showing some code and I encourage you to to go to the notebook. This is just showing it running in pandas, just for completeness. Um, so another, another thing that you have to take into account is what if, how do we balance this explore versus exploit concern? Um, and that's where the Bayesian optimization approach gives you this parameter called theta. 
And a lower theta is basically staying very close to exploit, and a higher theta stays very close to explore. And theta values tend to maybe like one to three or slightly less than one, just to give you an intuition of, of how we tend to set them. <clears throat> so if we set theta very high, now we see that the, the candidate we choose is actually the one with the highest standard deviation. So theta sort of reduces how much you care about the expected DCG gain and only focuses on um, higher standard deviation. So, yeah, and like I said, there is an even better algorithm that uh, you don't just want the probability something will improve, you want the expected improvement. So what is the DCG we expect and how much do we increase, expect it to increase? Um, and this basically tries to quantify what this is. Uh, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but there's similar intuition about using theta and that kind of thing for this as well. So what we do at Shopify, we have a, a system called Boogie, because we're the disco org, so we boogie, right? Uh, and we, it basically is our offline experimentation tooling. And uh, we, have, we do analysis experimentation on it. Uh, we get on the dance floor. Uh, but a big part of this is once we've sort of arrived at a relevant strategy, we then move to do optimization. So to transition over to uh, Andy, who's going to walk us through an example of how we use Bayesian optimization at Shopify. Thanks, Doug. So yeah, now it's time for an example. And uh, when you think Shopify, you probably think of over a million businesses that each need a search engine to help their customers find products. But uh, while we'd love to talk about how we bake a million muffins in one batch, we're going to actually talk about a single search engine that we tuned last year. So you might have heard this uh, earlier from Doug, but uh, the surface that we worked on is called the Shop app. And it's a place where people around the world can just connect to the app on their phone and connect to any of their favorite businesses. Uh, and the surface we added is this new discovery part here. So at the top, you can see there's a search engine, and you can type whatever you want. Maybe you're going to find something you like. Um, and you know, here's what the search results look like today. I mean, uh, hot sauce is one of my favorite queries, so this is sort of hand-picked, but um, you can see that it's a product search problem. You could have like hundreds of possible results that you need to rank and find you know, potentially the most interesting results. But uh, yeah, going back in time, uh, the results weren't always so good. And you know, here you can see uh, search results for Sailor Moon Ring. And if you don't know what Sailor Moon is, it's some TV show. Uh, so I've annotated here like the product titles. So this is a moon ring. That was the product title. This is a Sailor Moon, <laughs> uh, Sailor Moon something, right? And uh, you know this isn't quite right. Like we got a ring, but it's it's not actually anything to do with the TV show. And then we have other product types, so that's not very good. Um, and our setup, like if we if we looked back in time, uh, you know we had all these wonderful strategies in place, but they just weren't mixing together correctly. Uh, so do we need to add new features to our search engine? Do we need to do a bunch of new stuff? Uh, but what you can do is if you look down on the search results, you'd see plenty of great results that were possible, you know, could have been surfaced. And that's a hint that you probably need to think of rebalancing your weights, and we know about learning to rank, for example. So right setup, wrong parameters, that's kind of uh, the situation we're in. And uh, here's a sneak peek of the results afterwards. Um, you know, this, this query isn't like cherry-picked. We found out it improved over the course of the experiment. And it was just uh, really a great example. So we're going to get you there. But first, um, let's talk about the recipe for optimization. This is like a broad recipe that you're probably going to want to apply, whether you're using like just grid search or, or our framework. So uh, you know, data is absolutely essential, the you know, judgments talk earlier. But you're going to need a notion of a training sample and a holdout. Like you're optimizing, you're telling this thing bake better cakes over and over, but it's biasing slowly to the data you have. So uh, you absolutely need to check on a different type of data whether it learned the right things, and if you're happy with that, and then you can iterate. So um, one tip I give people is, if your training data set had genes, wallets, whatever in it, try to train on different queries, or try to try to evaluate on different queries in your holdout. Uh, or at least different data. Now, 
data is scarce, you can't always afford to do this, but it's going to really help catch some weird behaviors. Um, so if possible. And then, uh, you know, just to be clear, what, what is our training data looking like? You know, what are we optimizing? Um, we have graded judgments, and those judgments tell us, hey, these original style genes uh, get a lot of clicks in search sessions. Uh, whereas the gene outfit, like, you know, it got returned in the search results, but wasn't what people wanted, right? Um, and our goal is to optimize DCG. So can we re-rank these products by changing the boosts to improve DCG? And you can choose any metric you want, but it's basically baked into your data. So that's why I grouped those. All right, so with data in mind, um, you now need to figure out which parameters you're gonna optimize. And uh, you know, start small <laughs> is my advice, right? Especially if this is your first time rebalancing things. It's not about necessarily the computation, like, you know, that is a factor, um, but you want to be able to trace back and figure out what changed and, and what the effects were. So if you want to get scientific about your changes, if you change too many things, you change all 15 parameters of your search engine, how are you going to go validate that thing? So start small. And one way you can start smaller than maybe you thought you could have is to share parameters. So for those unfamiliar, a minimum should match just says, when you're matching a query like Sailor Moon Ring, how many of those tokens should match through? Um, and there's really no reason to have a minimum should match for this field and another field, and you know maybe there is, but uh, if you can share that parameter, you're reducing the complexity. So get smart about that. You know parameter sharing can really help. Um, next up, you want to set reasonable ranges. We'll basically discuss this later so you can see what that looks like, but you just have to tell it, like optimize between zero and one or zero and a million, don't do that. Um, and then next you're gonna run the optimizer and it's pretty useful out of the box, but we'll talk about some considerations, like especially if you're trying to get sophisticated. Um, one upside that I've found is that it works with any kind of search change that you're trying to simulate. It's like a very nonlinear style of, of optimizing, like you run all your search queries, something happened magically, and then it judges whether that was a good quality uh, recipe or not. So it works with nonlinear setups, whereas some, some traditional methods don't like when you're multiplying scores, for example, with uh, script scores. Um, and then as I'll show, I'll get tangible with all these, you can explore the best models. Like You're gonna get a candidate best model, but uh, what's really attractive of the framework is you get a distribution of models uh, that you can look at. You can start making better decisions from that. Um, and then iterate if needed, and it's almost always needed, like is your training data biased? Is the metric you're optimizing a little bit blind to what you actually are trying to achieve? You can create some custom metrics, get creative, um, and, and so forth. So we apply this each relevance cycle, like when we add new features, when, we, when things just change, things stop working well, uh, you, can, you can reapply this. Okay, so now onto the experiment, and we're gonna skip the training and holdout data, like you know, try to write some pipelines that do that for you. Uh, now we're looking at parameters. So just first thing I wanna say is we have both index parameters and query parameters, query time parameters, and both are supported. So that especially can feel nonlinear in many cases. Um, and as you wrap your head around what I'm talking about, it's all just focused on product titles. It was a pretty narrow experiment. We want to change just a few things. And uh, now jumping in. So top two parameters are BM25 parameters for the product title field and shared across stemming and non-stemming. Uh, and we'll talk about B and K, but may sound familiar. Um, and then we have our unstemmed product title fields and we have two different matches uh, there. We have a regular match uh, clause and then the match phrase clause. And we just randomly said, okay, B between 0 0.1 and 1, because it's all going to be relative in the end anyways. Uh, and th then they're not like huge values that look scary to new people. Um, and then same thing for the, the bottom two. Those are just the stemmed versions of those matches. So match and match phrase. Okay, a uh, small detour very quickly about B and K for BM25. Uh, B will be useful. So, um, yeah, like, you know, looking at the, these curves here, we can see um, the yellow curve falls off really fast. And that's all you got to really know is that when B is higher, that's the default setting of BM25's B value. Uh, as, as products get longer and longer titles, so let's say Sailor Moon Ring, that's already three tokens, this thing is telling me that uh, it's, you know, it's going to be almost at 70% 
of the maximum match score just because of its length. So the role of B is to just punish documents that have longer lengths, and that kind of already feels unintuitive. So anyway, um, the role of K, uh, we are using a modified version of BM25. We're using like binarized term frequencies. So usually there would be like, instead of those ones in the numerator and denominator, there would be a term frequency. Um, you know, it doesn't do anything basically in our case. So if we did this optimization again, quick lesson, if you know a parameter is not gonna be very influential, you might wanna just fix it to something arbitrary. Of course, to be fair, like B and K in, in different applications have really important purposes. But uh, in our case, K in particular isn't gonna do a lot. There's no term frequencies to saturate. Okay, back to the experiment. So we got back results magically. You know, we ran our optimizer. Um, but we're getting back a really, really high value for B in our BM25. Uh, and, you know, we could have trust the optimizer, but we started looking around at some results and we were a little bit concerned. So here's the new curve. The proposed curve is in red and it's really falling off very steeply as product titles get lengthier. Um, so basically, we know product titles provide a lot of information to buyers. They need to figure out, is this the right product before they click in? So we, we don't want to have people having like really short product titles, just says ring, when you gotta go find out what it actually is. So the first lesson here, um, you know, maybe it was clickbait, I said we got results, but the first lesson is that optimizers are pretty lazy, or maybe they're smart, who knows? But if there is a loophole in your data, they're gonna find it. So uh, we're ranking thousands of products, and if a product's just called a shirt, then, well, it's really easy to kind of guess like, well, just return products with that equal the query, right? Like someone types cert, uh, shirt, return a shirt. Uh, so it's very lazy and, you know, the optimizer started to do that. Uh, and then the second thing is our data itself had a presentation bias in it. So our past search engine was using the default BM25 parameter. And as a result, a lot of the things that were getting clicks were just the ones that were being presented. So we had to break the loop and we did that. So attempt two now, now things are gonna look better. So uh, now we forced the optimizer to just kind of be constrained in, in the B department, and now we have B values between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. And the optimizer uh, began running, and it prints out at each batch kind of the next parts of the parameter space that it's interested in. And we get with those explorations what the model thinks, the internal Bayesian model thinks the quality of these new search configurations are gonna look like, as well as how, how uncertain it is about that. And together, you can optimize uh, the next choice. And if we were you know, in higher dimensional existences, then we might see a six dimensional version of the, these fun plots where you know, the, the uncertain regions get explored. But what we instead monitor over time um, in practical settings is just progress over time, like quality of the models over time. And the batches sample a bunch of different models all at once, so that's why there's sort of like these vertical behaviors. But the takeaway here really is just that this isn't just the gradient descent where you're just going up and up and up until you settle at a little hill. This optimizer is looking around and it's, it's sampling bad, it's sampling good. Sometimes regions have a lot of uncertainty, sometimes they don't. So when you see the bouncing around behavior, that is by design. And what you should see though over the very long term is improvement. Uh, so we do see here that every once in a while we do find a nice pocket of space. Okay, so now we have a best model that was recommended by the constrained optimization. That was really easy to constrain. Um, the B value is low, we kind of told it to do that. Uh, but it found out that, hey, like you have a precision problem. You should probably rely more on phrases. And that's actually starting to make sense given the example we had earlier. Um, but now we can actually spend a moment on the second lesson. So don't just take the best one. It was actually a great uh, suggestion, but don't just take your best model. Uh, you're gonna want to also look at comparable models. So let's say the best model had a DCG of 0 0.5, and then everything really close, 0 0.48 plus, you know, nearby, you can look at those. And with those top candidates, you get a distribution. So here you're seeing a kind of funky distribution. K can be a lot of things, and the model's still good. And as I said earlier, because we weren't using term frequencies, that actually makes sense, it's, it's not playing a major role. Um, whereas the match boost, which is just like a very fundamental part of our system, is just matching, um, it's, it's getting a lot of weight and that's reassuring. So we can see the distribution is centering a lot 
right around 1.0, 1, 1 which is the max. So uh, look at the distributions and try to figure out, do these things make sense? So here's a summary of the changes. BM25 no longer overemphasizing the length of titles. We have stemmed matches, which were a little bit noisy, just acting as recall padding, kind of lowering down in their boost. And then phrases were doubled down on, which, is, which was great. So yeah, the new curve um, looking a lot flatter, looking a lot more reasonable. So the new red line is saying, hey, like if you're a longer product title, that's totally fine. And um, so altogether, uh, we decided to test the system and we use offline experimentation for that. And as I mentioned earlier, we have not just what we trained on, but also our holdout data sets. But if you notice, the first row, it's actually, that's actually our training data. And um, you know, it's, it says 0%, it says neutral. And you might think, what in the world has this thing done? So the thing is, if you remember, we've constrained what's possible. We, we said, don't be lazy. Stop returning single length product titles. And when we told the model not to be lazy, it had to find an alternate solution to the same problem. So with the alternate solution, we actually saw that on other holding out data, uh, some of them, <coughs> uh, we saw a lot of improvements, but also one of the data sets was just completely held out, like not based on our old search engine. It was uh, manually labeled by independent raters. So we saw uh, huge wins there. So yeah, that's the story. And then the takeaways here is your search engine might have the right strategies. Sometimes all that's needed is a rebalancing, and this is a very lightweight way to, to do that. So you don't need to go all the way into learning to rank. Uh, and parameter optimization, just like anything in search, is a bit of a science and an art, but in a way that completely makes sense. If you're going to modify your search engine, you need the right data to do your offline experiments or whatever you're doing. You need to make sure you're optimizing the right metric. So obviously, online, we kind of really care about making sure sales occur. But offline, if we just only optimize for DCG, it might not be what we actually are trying to improve. So choose the right metric, share parameters where you can, and so forth. These are all important tricks. And yeah, there's, there's a bunch of future work. I just want to call out uh, from last year, the Learning to Boost uh, framework is, is really wonderful. And I would love to compare, like, uh, do they agree a lot? Uh, wh when is one better? Um, but it, it's also a really great uh, strategy for optimizing your template. Uh, and there's lots more, um, especially if you want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk about some of the tunings and, and like, you know, open questions, frankly, about, about how to make this thing even better and, and to tune it. Okay, uh, so Doug's actually going to close on learning to rank. Yeah, so the question becomes, uh, this is really useful and it's nice because you don't have to deploy a lot of infrastructure. And what's different with learning to rank, just to point this out? Um, a lot of times, the main thing is with learning to rank, you're learning a more arbitrary functional form, whereas with the Bayesian optimization, we're constraining the functional form to, to, the, to the ranking function expressed in the query. So that is, that is a huge difference. Um, and so like Lambda Mart is sort of like learning a generic function. A deep learning model is, you know, those learn, can learn generic functions constrained by their architecture. Uh, of course, the pro with the Bayesian optimization, why I think it's maybe a good starting point before taking on LTR uh, is it's a simpler infrastructure. It's sort of semi-human involved manual tuning. So you're sort of like getting inspiration and informing your manual process as opposed to LTR, which is, you know, requiring a bit more automation. Um, and yeah, so I think that, that pretty much closes it. Um, I may also put in a lightning talk for how we are thinking about Bayesian optimization for overcoming presentation bias, but I won't spoil that, but I'll put that up there if you vote for it. Uh, so uh, that is it, and uh, yeah. Oh, come work for us, please. There's, of course, everyone's hiring. Thank you, Andy and Doug. So we'll take some questions, um, and I'll walk around. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, how you guys created your training data sets uh, for running this offline and what were the challenges? And maybe specifically, how did you guys do any query uh, standardization or how did you guys handle, let's say, if the did you guys do any normalization on the queries or any pre-processing on queries for preparing your data set? Thank you. Uh, great question. Um, so we use, uh, 
what's interesting is so we were actually could be a whole separate uh, talk, I think, on we were building an app that wasn't used yet. So we were using lots of proxies for training data. And so that's another reason we were taking everything with a grain of salt. So we have a we use a click model. Uh, we use the standard dynamic Bayesian network. Um, we we only the only normalization we do is really lower casing. Um, and uh, within that, we similar to how Rene in his talk applies a beta prior. We apply a beta prior so we don't over we don't treat one click out of one examine as a uh, as like the same as 100 out of 100. So short, that's a short story. And then uh, we also, Andy actually led a, a, an effort because this was a, a new search engine with manual raters, uh, which is probably its own other haystack talk. So these are lightning talks, actually. So keep this in mind, Andy, uh, that, uh, that made sure to, Renee, Renee has said this a lot, like topicality of uh, sort of queries. Like one of the things that we, was our goal before shipping was get to a certain threshold of topical relevance. Uh, and that was that was sort of like our golden standard for for re releasing a new app. Yeah, it does. Oh, cool. Hello. Hello. Yeah. You can. Oh, go ahead. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you guys for amazing talk. I learned a lot from from you guys. Uh, one thing you guys mentioned is that the Bayesian optimization is really well, uh, does really well with the nonlinearities. Uh, does that also include like drastic changes in uh, your data corpus? Like you know, if you guys like injected like you know, and like a crazy amount of like stores uh, into your index, and does that like uh, Bayesian optimization also handles uh, the the scores, which changes? With the DFIS scores like going crazy as the number of, of uh, documents increase. Yeah, so on the shop app, which uh, has all types of different stores, definitely the index is continually updating. Uh, we have you know new merchants, new products all the time. Uh, so that can be a bit of a challenge if the term frequencies shift, or uh, you know with BM25 the various document frequencies, but. Uh, the great thing is, is like, you know, we're baking a million muffins, so each of those uh, are constantly changing, but, you know, we're able to do optimization on any type of training data that we have, so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, go crazy if, if your training data shifts. Um, it's pretty, pretty general. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, one of the arts of what we, what we have to do is create a good sample, too, for, for this kind of thing, so that's, we spend a lot of time sampling, and then periodically, we what we call we, for some reason we came to call a meta experiment. We run periodically where we will restudy our current uh, features, based ranking features, and figure out how they sh maybe adjust over time. So, uh, thanks, Doug and Andy. Really well presented. Um, I guess I'm I'm sort of wondering, being relatively naive to this, uh, the scale of training data that you need. So, you know, uh, it, order of magnitude of how many queries, how many documents do you need to get full coverage on? And then, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you get people to do that many manual judgments um, in order to get some good results on, on a technique like this? Yeah, I mean, you could get manual raters. You don't need too much data for this because it's not following a gradient. Like, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with the current way that people are optimizing in LTR, but if you're following some sort of gradient descent, you're going to have a lot of batches um, with noisy information. You just need lots of data to find a nice solution. With this one, you could have like 10 queries, 20 queries. I, I recommend around 50 at least with, uh, you know, 10 or more results. And, um, you know, it's, it's just doing a full, like, I'm going to simulate everything at once, get average DCG for that. And it's much less noisy, so uh, it it sort of reduces the variance by doing everything at once. But then it, you know it's a completely different framework. It's getting different information each batch. So as a result, though, I think it's actually amazing in in less data land. Uh, so maybe another reason to use it. Hi, yeah, we um 
Thanks for the talk, by the way. Uh, we did something like this at DICE. It's very similar. One of the challenges we had is you only have labels for rated documents, and so if you change a function too much, they don't come back. So what I ended up doing is just fixing the retrieval set and just treating it as a ranking task. How did you handle that? Because I, I noticed you, you're computing recall and other things which aren't ranking scores. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something. Uh, so when we we were building the shop app, so we had we had some we were using data co like collected from like the, the storefront like search judgments based on that, and that is a pros and cons. One con is people search on individual storefronts very differently than they do with on a marketplace. So you might type chocolate into a clothing store and expect that color, but of course that doesn't uh, make sense in a marketplace. So, uh, the, but the benefit of that was you kind of get this broader set of labeled data. The other thing that, uh, the other thing that when we, we kind of went through iterations of our manual relevance strategy, and eventually we decided to do fewer queries and go deeper, rather than trying to be too many queries. And so what we would do is, um, Andy would actually generate like tons of strategies of how you might search for something, and then just show them to our, our, con our, uh, our partners there that would label them. Um, yeah, and that, that helped a lot. Yeah, and I had a just a quick thought on that. So yeah, we like in this example, we treat it as a ranking change. We didn't change up the recall, but um, we also, when we create our samples, our data, like we call them down samples, we sometimes trick the thing to like, okay, here's what we have judgments for and a bit of noise added to that. And it kind of restricts the recall space to the old solution. And then it almost feels like a re-ranking, even if there's new search strategies involved. You could just think of the old one of having a boost of like zero, but the result set can't change by definition. So it's a little trick we used, but honestly, it's a huge challenge. So Yeah, it'll either try to, like, especially if the optimizer will try to just hey, old system thought document lengths mattered a lot. Like, that's the way it's just going to overfit. Um, and also, you'll just get a bunch of new stuff back with no judgments, which is very frustrating. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks, guys. I've got a, a question from our online audience. Um, Kylie asks, how did you guys choose th uh, Theta? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know how you want to we didn't. It worked out the box. But uh, I've fiddled with it, and it like really didn't change things much. But more serious answer is uh, you could run a few grid searches or, or Bayesian searches with different theta levels. And um, when you monitor that thing over time, you'll probably see, because theta emphasizes more exploration, you'll just see an even more jumpy curve. But who knows? Maybe you'll find a better model. So that's, that's an open question, though. It's a huge question. Okay, we got time, I think, for maybe two questions. There's one here, right? Thanks, guys. Um, this appeals to the uh, the hacker in me, and this, there seems to be sort of a range of approaches in search. One is the, uh, I'm going to do it manually, and I'm smart, and I can figure it out. And then there's the, uh, okay, let's try some simple technique that might work uh, before we get complicated. And then you have the sort of scientist thing where you say, oh, I, I've seen a paper about this. I, I, I love this. I mean, this seems to be... A, a great approach. These days, a lot of people are doing re-ranking. Uh, so you're, and one of the nice things about this is since you're adjusting the parameters of the first level search, that runs very fast. So it's a great first stage for re-ranking. But the goal of the first stage of re-ranking is to find a diverse enough set, uh, it's, it's not exactly recall, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but a diverse enough set that the re-ranker will do a good job. How would you uh, use this approach for that. Yeah, that's a that's a great great thought. Yeah, you're right. It's the one advantage is that it does work in the first pass, and you don't have to re-rank. Um, we didn't directly ch try to challenge diversity or try to build in diversity. Although I wonder, you know, we could make that one thing that we have worked on is um, changing the evaluation metric. So in our framework, we can change the evaluation metric. So if we did want to measure diversity explicitly and literally optimize for diversity, we could do that. Um, but yeah, that we I would say we haven't solved that problem. Uh, and uh, one, one, one way that LTR, actually, uh, 
the shop app has started to use LTR more, and they've actually been using Bayesian optimization to find the right ways of finding the right rear rank window for the for the LTR. So they these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive too. And uh, just a quick thought, I guess like for LTR on, on that app, we would probably be looking to improve certain online metrics like conversions. But um, maybe uh, I'm taking a hint here that with the Bayesian approach for the uh, proposal set, like the initial retrieval, maybe we can optimize something more clever that's gonna say like this is diverse and then throw it in the re-ranker. So we could still optimize something at this stage. Oh yeah, we, we didn't have an LTR at the point in time, so. Okay folks, one last question. Thank you for all the great questions. A lot of search domains have s explicit uh, use cases that are associated with them. So for example, in e-commerce, uh, known item searching versus product exploration. Um, I really like the explore aspect of this, and I was thinking if there's a way to either apply this optimization to known separate batches of use cases to see what the right configurations are for those, or whether there's a way to reverse engineer it, which is to say, look at the parameters that are maybe at the edge, but not optimized for the set, mm. and then deconstruct, can you then um, identify the, the particular s suite of parameters that are optimizing for s based on the queries? Yeah. In other words, an yeah. ideal for me would be run, run this algorithm and be able to say this this twenty percent of queries really 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 worked well with this thing that was at the extreme. Absolutely, I would look at those queries and see if it actually represents an intuitive real life use case. So, so sort of thinking about how do you apply this uh, to known use cases? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the experiments we ran that was very important to us because we needed to get head queries to work right was the head query use case. I searched for broad topic. The things in that need to be in that topic. And that uh, query form in Elasticsearch is expressed a little bit more conditionally. So it's like, if there is a category match between query and document, then do this other ranking step um, in the Elasticsearch query syntax. So um, to some of it comes down to how you formulate your query. And then the other thing that we would do, which uh, maybe Andy, you wanna talk about a bit, is just like how we think about downsample. Sometimes we sample yeah, well, uh, the first thought I had that came to mind is like we don't actually bake a million muffins at once. What we're aiming to do is maybe there's a cluster of similar businesses that can benefit from a certain search strategy. So this is going to be more re relevant for us this year. But um, in particular, like to make sure that if we're going to just do one optimization, you know, we <laughs> we're just trying to ship something. Um, instead of doing like a bunch of potential mixture model thing, we could just make sure in our holdout, like you'll notice I had a couple data sets, we really make sure that certain queries that were supposed to be unaffected were unaffected and so forth. So it's, it's an important thing. All right, well. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Andy and, and Doug.